some methods which a developer or an engineer needs to actually follow while being able to follow the process of agile and make a success. Um, I'm Shobit, I'm an architect and a senior engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I'm a core cont contributor to OpenShift IO, which is uh, associated with OpenShift and it makes you more and, and, and it helps you be an enabled developer as part of OpenShift. Um, so I'm going to make a few very radical statements here, which is you're not agile if you have a deployment day where you have a ceremony, people going on a Saturday to do a deployment. You're clearly not agile in that case. Uh, if, if you're waiting from some team who's, who's going to sign off your build so that it can go into production. Somebody complaining, sorry, my commit broke the build. That cannot just happen if you're the right person to in place. And only somebody in the team knows how to deploy and she will leave, so we've got to change things a bit now. That should not be happening. So you might need a downtime because you need to put in some more features. There's something clearly wrong if you've got to leave that. And yes, if you are a long Java engineer and it takes you 15 minutes to set up your workspace, that's very bad news. You're going to have somebody leaving the team sooner or later and then you're going to have a new member join the team and your entire planning is going to be off the window just because a new developer joined and it took him a full day to get started up. That should just not be happening. So, in summary, if these are the things which happens to your, you or your team, you're not an agile team anymore. Things have to clearly change, and, I, 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 and I'm going to show how being continuous is going to help you ensure that you can be agile and can you truly be able to you know, deploy every day and being able to release as soon as possible. Right, so the promise line is this every, com every commit should have tests. Uh, no tool can do that, or only a developer and somebody. Um, and an engineering manager who enforces this within the team, which means no change request is going to be accepted without tests. And your report should have their books configured, of course, but that's a technical thing to ensure that your builds get triggered. Um, your change request should trigger tests. Every March to master should actually be deployed in an environment, which means if I know that my change is going to be deployed somewhere, I know somebody will be screaming at me if I break things. But if I know that my change is going to remain in master for the next three months before it's going to be actually used, I'm going to actually be okay being careless with, with my comments there. Right, and every day should be a deployment day. So if you make a fix today, there should be no big reason why it cannot go to production today itself. Right, so let's see how uh, something we've been working on, OpenShift IO can do it all for you. You can, of course, do it with a ton of other open source projects as well. But this is one open source project uh, being hosted as a product which can actually help you do this. I'll try to see if I can get a live demo done, else I'll record it. Right, so you effectively start with, you know, Day one, you create a new application, the typical things. Let me try to show you a picture. So you have typical things, you create an application, you choose what kind of REST API you want to build. Let's say you're supposed to work on a backend service. Uh, and then you choose what kind of framework that will be. You move on to selecting some dependencies. For the sake of simplicity, we will skip this. And then you're going to go on to choosing what kind of pipeline you have, which means, let's say you want to set up builds automatically because that's the first thing you should be doing. That's, that's not something that's going to come on day 10, it has to be on day 0 itself. You choose, let's say, okay, your build, deploy it to a staging environment, and if somebody okays it, you're going to deploy it on production environment. And I've made all those choices, what kind of code base, what kind of Jenkins pipelines or build I want. And then I'm going to go ahead and set up my app application. On day one, it should not be taking longer to set up a very bare bones code base which does a hello world REST API to me. So you set up your application and this should effectively set up your basic code base so that you can get going. 
This should have your Jenkins webhook set up, or whatever the system you are using. You should have your build pipeline set up, and you should have the whole process of deploying code also set up as well. This is something super common. So, uh, the bunch of processes actually went ahead and created a repo right away from this application itself. This is your bare bones REST API, which has a basic stuff built in. You can also check this code out and run it locally if you want, but then you don't have to. Because right now we are going to show how you can actually test it out and run it on a build and deployment environment right away to say that this thing works. So the next person who joins in your team does not complain that whatever code he gave me does not work. It actually works, right? So we go ahead and now we kind of take a look at what's happening after we just get to the code base. So the first zero at day, you should have your code base built successfully. This page lists all the different code bases I have. This is the code base which got created for me right away. I go to pipelines, deployments. And on the pipelines page, I can see a new build has been triggered already, which means I just created a code base. It seems like my webhooks were already configured in there because the system did it for me. And then I'm opening a console. I see there's already a Jenkins build happening because I have triggered it by some other process, but not explicitly. So at this stage, what it does is, it actually means that on day one, you get a code base set up. You can actually tell somebody it does build as well, which means the first step is a build release, which means in an agile team, you should not be spending a week on writing some code, some basic boilerplate code, and then in the end trying to figure out how to deploy it in Jenkins. That should be the first thing that's happening. So the first step is let's compile this code base. Let's see if I can see if I can build out out of this. Now that's done, let's see if we can actually deploy this tiny amount of this tiny service into a staging environment, which is basically based on which is basically an open shift in the environment. And then yes, it looks good. It did get deployed to stage. And then now I want to check if uh, I want to approve this or not. I quickly click and see if my application is working. Yes, I see I've got, got a decent HTTP booster in there where I can fill, fill in some text and it should call a REST API and actually demonstrate that the REST API is actually working in there. Right, so now I go back to my pipelines page for a bit. And now that it's working, I decide why not have a push button way to actually take it to the next environment. I say let's promote it to production now. So what it effectively does is it takes my code from one environment which was built at stage one and then deploys it to run. And it also also gives you a nice neat link to actually see if what I deployed had actually gone in there. And I say yes, the same application has been deployed in a different URL output. I'm sure it's not very visible, but there's a different URL output. Right, so what, what, we, what we just accomplished is, within minutes, we had a day zero in a project done. Which means, you had a code base, you had a build and a Jenkins set up, and you have to test it out that the deployments are working. I go to OpenShift online and they actually check my app is deployed there, there is one pod running in there, there is a route exposed, so this uh, kind of tells tell us, okay, at this stage we have the basic stuff built in, now we can give this code to somebody else to go in and explore. Maybe let's say I want to open up a workspace to edit, and for anyone who tried on Java would know, it takes quite a while to set up the Eclipse local desktop ID where when you try the first time, you know, it's all a bunch of dependencies, get it working, and stuff like that, right? So what this does is effectively, with a click button, it spawns up on your workspace, right? Away. Which means your workspace is not just a web-based ID, it's basically a full-fledged ID with, with a container running behind it. Which means all the dependencies you need for your workspace, everything you need to ensure you have your build, run, debug working from the comfort of, of your web app, without you having to do any local install at all. 
So what what this effectively does is it logs into your OSO, which is an application called OpenShift Online, which means it ensures that it can talk to your OpenShift Online because this one itself is deployed in an OpenShift Online namespace. And then it goes on to ensure that it works with API works and that you have a real terminal inside the chain. So which means if you are still the developer who needs a terminal, this does not deprive you of that. This gives you a terminal, a full-fledged one, where, where you can run your Git commands, your Java commands, your Maven commands, from the comfort of the web ID, so that, that you don't have to figure out how to install all of that in your local environment. So now I'm going to check out my code from GitHub. And you can see the code which I have on GitHub has been checked out. Just gives a few green ticks telling the developer that things have been set up for her. So this whole workspace took me, I think, about a minute to get set up compared this to any developer actually checking out the code I have in the repository and setting it up locally with all the conflicts with Java versions, get your Maven in place, and ensuring you know all the Maven commands, etc., to get it working. So what I'm going to do is I quickly go in and open my source code and make a tiny change and make a GitHub comment from inside the workspace itself. So I get to my code base where I have the REST API defined. And then I'm going to go and update some stream in there and try to make a comment and maybe make a pull request to my GitHub repository to show that you can actually contribute to any open source project if you have all the things connected in place. So I just update some response string which is going to be returned by the REST API. And I've done a control save in here when I save the report with, when I save this recording. So that's not really visible here. So I'm going to create a new branch. Now I'm going to make he gave me the branch a new name. I can do the same thing using the terminal as well around there, but I, I thought it's nice to just use the UI for, for a change. Uh, I'm going to open a pull request with this change right away. I just key in my title, the command, sorry, the, the comment in there, and I should just do a create PR. And what that effectively would do is create a branch in my GitHub repository, and at the same time open a pull request to it. And I'm going to show you all this is going to happen without you having to set up your local git repo, which means you don't have to do your git add remote upstream, git add remote, do your personal space. I just do a bunch of ticks and I say, okay, we are good to comment this and we are also good to push this to GitHub. So down there on the right, you see branch push on your origin. A blue tick there is issued and a blue tick there. It says your pull request has been created. Now let me click open on GitHub. At the same time, if you, if you don't believe it really works, you can actually go in there and enter your workspace and see you can do a bit status. And you can say it's all clear, which means all, all my comments have actually gone up there. I open my comment on GitHub and this is what I just committed. And you can see down there, a bill has already been triggered for the workspace which I created 10 minutes back without me having to explicitly set up their books, etc. It starts a bill out there and while that's happening, we can quickly check one interesting thing. There's a link out here which came up in this pull request. If I click here, it's going to open me another workspace, cloud workspace, which means if you're reviewing my code, you don't have to check out your code in your local ID to test it out. You can actually click here. It should start up a web-based ID full-fledged and actually help you to go in and change code in there if you think you need to try something out in your local ID before you actually approve it. So I'm going to kind of 
take, take a few steps back and talk about what just happened right now. So effectively, every company should have tests. It's not something tooling can do much about. Tooling can of course check whether this change request has some tests. So you can actually check whether your pull request has tests, but then that's something more of a culture the developers need to bring in. Every input did have the webhooks configured. That's why you saw Bill get triggered as soon as you opened the pull request. The change request did trigger the test. We saw a yellow thing in there. Merge to merge should be deployed. We haven't done that yet. Every deployment should be a production quality, which means if you know my change is going to be deployed, you're going to be careful about ensuring the change is of production quality. And yes, your data could be a deployment day if you have the rest taken care of. Right, so now that you have these basic things done, let me actually show you what developer onboarding looks like. So you have a new developer com coming into your team who has been told that we have some code base which was set up already by somebody who has ensured that everything works. And at this point of time, you need to come and start coding. And here is an issue which somebody has said during the planning meeting that it was just one story point. And you're like, I just joined the team. I need a day to at least figure out how to write code in an Eclipse ID. And then I can start looking at code and working on it. Which means your planning has already gone wrong in there. You have a new member in the team who has been assigned a task for one story point. But he clearly says that it's going to take him four story points because he's new in the team. So it means the developer onboarding is hard at that point. So, this is what happens. 
happens in the end, which means the developer does write code with you know all the trouble of getting a new, okay, getting his approvals, getting his local environment set up, and then gives the code to ops, whom you can also call DevOps these days. And that person has to even the vision of DevOps are supposed to work together, but effectively, if you have a code somewhere, you have a development script somewhere, you have a puppet script somewhere, and somebody in DevOps would actually have to need to take the code and deploy it, which is wrong, which means you're now creating a situation where the DevOps can come back to you to tell you, you know what, my puppet scripts are working perfectly fine till you join the company. And now with your change it doesn't work anymore. Which means the developer lost some ownership of his code the service on the Because somebody else is telling him, you know what, this does not work. I'm sure this was not work for you locally, but have you really tested the whole thing on a VM? Why would he do that? He has got other better stuff to write than actually test out by deploying himself on a traditional one. So which is why you need to use something like cloud workspace. So when I say cloud workspace, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to pull you into using web technologies by running a local machine. Everything you see here as a cloud workspace, what it means is it works on OpenShift, which means if you can get an OpenShift running locally, you can have the same workspace running locally in your laptop without all the network latencies which you don't like. Right, so a tiny amount of demo before my time goes out. So this part of the part of the demo is actually showing how a developer's typical day in office should be. If you actually is not spending too much time setting up things and getting approvals done. So this is my full feathered ID, which I was just talking about a few minutes back. So what I'm going to try to do is, I'm going to try this time to actually push to master, never try this at home. But after pushing to master, I'm, I'm going to show you how a build is going to be triggered and a deployment is going to happen right away. The whole idea of showing this is to ensure we stick to the promised land of every change to master should be deployed. And that should be part of the day zero process which we mentioned something like that. So I just made some code change, then I flip over to the next file to actually go in and I'll be in a test because, like I said, my code chains without a test should not be even entertained. And the reason I made this test is because the build would fail without that. Because the build does check that tests are run every time you make a code change. So I know all the geeky stuff in there to change my code. This is basically a simple string change now. And I try to directly push to master. I'm trying to create a PR to master, which doesn't work. So it'll be just pushing my code to a remote repository. And I do a bunch of click ins. And on the bottom right, I see a branch push to origin. And I'll quickly head over to the code base here to check when, when the last update was, it's 26 minutes ago. Then I refresh, it's 18 seconds ago, which means I just managed to do a comic from within my web ID and I need to ensure that this does get deployed by now. And now as soon as it committed, it should actually go through running the build again, which means even though the code is in master, it does not necessarily mean it's going to get deployed because it's wrong to actually deploy code which you haven't tested against your own tests. And if you have good test written, Agile is going to work for you because which means you plan to develop you know, a sub-feature in two weeks and after, after the sub-feature is done, with good tests, it's going to a next environment or production, ensuring that nothing is broken and also ensuring that whatever you what did right now and you committed to right now is actually released. It should, you should not have to wait for somebody else to okay your bid. So if you do have a QE team within your teams, just ensure they spend all the time on automating the tests. This means they should never be a blocker or they should never come in the way to you wanting to, to a developer wanting to promote code to the next environment. That should never just happen. Right, so I started the build. And let's see where this goes. Yep, looks like the first stage has started. The build release is happening in there. So in the meantime, the background, it checks out the code. It ensures that it's mergeable. In this case, it is pushed to master. There's a question of being more mergeable. It tries to run a test and doing so, 
it's going to try to figure out if you do have enough resources to be able to run the test. So it's doing all that, taking a while in there, and then it's going to try to take it to the next environment called states, and then the next environment called run. So, so effectively, what we could do this data right now is ensure that the code is built, the code has been pushed, the build has been triggered, and gradually there should be a problem with it. Let's hang on there. Let's check the logs. We are interested in tests. Let's see if they have shown up somewhere. Right, the first one is gone. Right, you can see in there. My tests are being run now, which means if, if they fail here, then I'm going to clearly abort mission right now and return to this. And start coding again. Yeah, my test of past it looks like acting uh, deployment. It tries to deploy to stage right now, which means it's got to de deploy to stage after installing your tests of fine. And now it's wait for me to verify that my API is working fine. The tiny button in there and ensure that the API works. But part of that, let me actually show you what's really happening in there. So not what it's doing right now is on OpenShift, it's trying to do a rolling deployment, which means it doesn't take out the container which was running, which means if it's trying to deploy something and it didn't work while it was being brought up, it doesn't complain. It just sits back and forgets about it and lets what was working keep working, which means right what they did is it tra transitioned from version 1 to version 2 without bringing down the first one till your second one was up. This means you just did a zero downtime deployment on a staging environment to ensure that you don't have to, just because the developer made a mistake in, in his code, it should not cause a downtime for your customers. You should still have the processes and machinery in place to ensure that things still work. So in this case, good news for us, we could actually go ahead with the de deployment and in the next stage is it, it's going to do the same thing for my next environment as well. So having said that, we took you to a journey from setting up a new code base from the scratch and showing you that you can have systems in place which automate the mundane task of setting up your webhooks, your build triggers, your deployment secrets, your deployment process, etc. You can automate all that on day zero and if you do that you can ensure that everything your developers are doing every day and trying to push code every day to different environments if your processes and tech is in the right place then you should be able to deploy code to production every day and be truly a child Thank you very much.